Hello, and welcome to Calico VPP, All You Can Eat Networking. Uh, my name is Casey, and I'm a software engineer at Tigera, uh, where I work as a core developer on Calico. I am really excited to be here today with Alois, uh, who has been doing some awesome work in the Calico community, uh, bringing compatibility with VPP networking. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Casey. My name is Alois, and I work as a software engineer for Cisco, more specifically in the VVP team. I'm super excited to talk about the work we've been doing with Calico, but before we dive into that, let's hear from Casey how Calico was designed and how it made this Calico VPP integration possible. So I'd like to start by giving a quick overview of Calico, um, how it works, and some of the lower level design decisions that uh, we as the Calico team uh, have made to help uh, enable some of this really awesome work that Alois has been doing. Um, so to start, Calico is an open source networking and network policy uh, provider. It can provide um, networking and network policy for Kubernetes pods, um, but also Kubernetes nodes, uh, VMs, OpenStack, and legacy workloads. Uh, Calico supports the, the native built-in Kubernetes network policy APIs, as well as um, a rich extension set of APIs that, that are native to Calico. Um, and Calico self, itself is battle-tested. It's uh, you know, been deployed in production for, for years now um, and is really the most common choice in clusters that need to scale and where performance really matters. So um, for those of you who might not be familiar with Calico, at uh, a really high level, it works like this. Um, users specify high level descriptions of how they want their network to behave, uh, either via the Kubernetes API, the Calico APIs, um, or both. Uh, and this is, this is stuff like network policies, uh, BGP configuration, um, et cetera. That configuration is in turn read by uh, the Calico components, which are running on every node in your cluster. Um, and Calico then takes that and combines it with the locally running pods that it knows about and uses the result to set up each node with the correct network programming. Drilling down a bit further, um, here's what's happening on each Calico node. Uh, there are really two main components. There's the CNI plugin, which uh, is called by the container runtime as part of um, setting up and tearing down networking for each pod. Um, so this, this plugin gets called on pod add and pod delete, and it's responsible for setting up um, you know, the network namespace, uh, programming routes, virtual ethernet devices, um, you know, all the stuff that it, a pod needs in order to be able to communicate with its own local node. Calico node is the, the second main component of Calico. Um, and this is a long lived container uh, that runs on every node, typically as a daemon set. And it makes routing and policy decisions. Um, so this is really what's interpreting that configuration and making sure that, uh, you know, the network data plane is, is programmed correctly. And within Calico node, there are two main subcomponents that, that are responsible for this. Um, there's Felix, which is a component that the Calico team wrote. Um, and Felix is responsible for uh, maintaining network policy state. Uh, and there's Bird, which is uh, an open source networking stack, which is included in Calico um, and is used when BGP is required to distribute routes through the network. Uh, now, obviously, each of these components needs to be pretty tightly coupled with the underlying networking technology because they're each reading and writing state, uh, you know, and interacting with that data plane. Now, with a bit of understanding about what Calico is and, and roughly how it works. I, I wanted to talk about one of the core principles we uh, on the engineering team follow um, when developing Calico. Uh, specifically, uh, 
um, that is to use the right tool for the job at hand. Uh, you know, technology and implementations are important, uh, but they change over time. As engineers, it's it's really easy to lose sight of this sometimes. Uh, you know, you lose lose the forest for the trees. Um, and, and it's really easy to focus on the technology choices rather than what's actually really important, um, which is leveraging that technology to actually solve someone's problems. So in other words, um, we want to do with Calico is to make sure that the design of the software enables using the right technology to solve the various diverse problems that uh, our users have. Uh, and there are a lot of ways that, you know, this mindset shows itself in Calico. Um, we've got multiple built-in networking techniques uh, using IPIP, VXLAN, unencapsulated BGP. Um, we've got compatibility with a wide array of third-party CNI plugins, um, et cetera. But the main design decision that I wanted to talk about today um, is the separation of control plane functions and data plane functions. And specifically how this enables Calico to meet uh, a variety of use cases leveraging different underlying data plane technologies. Conceptually, this is a pretty common pattern in networking software. Um, you know, the control plane is, you know, this, complex software that performs routing calculations and it needs to be kept separate from high performance packet processing code. But for Calico, I really see a more important consequence of this pattern than just resource isolation. When we first built Calico, it, it only supported a single data plane. That is standard Linux networking. Um, this is routing using uh, Linux routes and filtering using IP tables. Still, um, at the time, we were pretty clear that we wanted to architect this code in such a way that uh, if we needed to, we could extend it to support additional data planes in the future. Um, you know, this provides us future proofing uh, and gives us flexibility to choose the best tool for the job. Uh, and avoids us getting fixated on a single data plane technology. To do this, we pulled all of the intelligence into a subcomponent of Felix called the calculation graph. Um, and then we built an internal API uh, within Calico um, between this calculation graph and a swappable data plane driver component. Uh, if you're familiar with it, this is parallel to how the container runtime interface works in Kubernetes. Um, it enables using a bunch of different container runtimes like Docker, Cryo, ContainerD, um, while still providing a consistent feature set and user experience to the end user. So uh, the data plane driver in Calico is designed to be as simple as possible. It just translates events emitted by the calculation graph uh, into the right messages for the underlying data plane implementation. And it leaves the, the hard work that we don't want to duplicate, um, you know, interpreting configuration, making decisions uh, up to the calculation graph. While we started with just a single implementation, uh, you know, we've since been able to take advantage, advantage of this decision to extend support to a variety of technologies. Uh, you know, this includes an eBPF based data plane, uh, a Windows HNS data plane, and of course, what we're here to talk about today, which is uh, a data plane built on VPP. Um, and just for completeness, you know, while those slides were really focused on how this works in Felix, um, the Calico CNI plugin also supports gRPC based data plane drivers, um, in addition to the you know, default compiled in implementation. Uh, and this was a feature that was added by Alois as part of the, uh, the VPP integration effort. Which leads me um, to really the, the last and most important ingredient of Calico, which is 
its collaborative community. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who have made, made Calico happen, and it's through this community that uh, we've been able to build a, re a relationship with Alois and his team, um, who's now going to, to share with you how he's built upon this foundation to uh, bring something really cool in the form of uh, VPP support to Calico. Thanks, Casey. So now that we know how Calico works and supports multiple data plane, let's see how we leverage this to add VPP as a data plane option for Calico. But first, a few words about VPP. VPP is an open source software router uh, under the Linux Foundation umbrella. It has many features from layer 2 to layer 4. It supports tunneling, NAT, ACL, uh, but also transport protocols such as TCP, TLS, and Quick. It's built to be easily extensible thanks to a plugin architecture. It supports both virtual and physical interfaces and has a really fast API. But if there is one thing you must remember about VPP, it is that it's really highly optimized. It uses vector instructions in order to process multiple packets in a single instruction. It uses prefetches heavily in order to improve the data cache efficiency. And the packet processing is split into a graph of small elementary nodes uh, that ensure that the instruction cache is also very efficient. You may wonder what user space networking exactly is. It's actually quite simple. It's just a regular process that does packet processing instead of, for instance, HTTP request processing. So it's packets in, packets out. There are many examples of user space networking applications that you've probably used. Uh, they include VPN clients like OpenVPN or proprietary VPN clients, DPDK-based applications as well, and of course, VPP. So there are many benefits to user space networking. The most important one to us is performance. When you have a user space network stack, you can tune it to do exactly what you need for your specific use case. You don't have to rely on a general purpose stack that have features that you may not need and that would be detrimental to performance. It's also simpler to develop and deploy because you don't have any dependency on your kernel, so you can make changes without rebooting your machine. Um, and it allows you to manage your own network stack just like any other software component. This is possible thanks to specific interface types provided by the Linux kernel that allow to retrieve packets in user space, and drivers that allow to expose physical interfaces in user space as well. There has been a recent trend in the Linux kernel to increase its modularity. The most obvious example is eBPF, which allows to inject code in the kernel and bypass parts of its network stack, for instance. Uh, but there are also other examples, such as AFXDP, which allows to implement very fast and generic user space networking functions, and also tune and tap interfaces, um, which, thanks to the implementation of Virtio backends, MultiQueue, and GSO, allow to very efficiently exchange packets with the Linux kernel. So this modularization is very beneficial to user space networking. It allows to use the best tool for each job, and it really opens many new options to make things more efficient. And thanks to these recent improvements in the Linux kernel, it's now possible to leverage user space networking stacks to accelerate regular Linux applications. VVP was initially designed for environments where it had a fixed amount of resources and it could consume all of them. Of course, that's not really well suited to container environments. Ideally, you would want VPP's resource consumption to scale up and down with the actual load. Um, so one thing we did in order to improve VPP's behavior in container environments is to switch from poll mode, where VPP is constantly busy looping, checking if new packets are available for processing, to interrupt mode, where VPP is actually notified by the network interfaces when packets are available. So this allows to reduce the CPU that is actually consumed by VPP. Regarding memory, VPP used to require huge pages to run. But this makes it more complex to deploy because you need to change the configuration of your host. So we removed this requirement as well. We also made some improvements in VPP that allow it to better integrate with the Linux kernel. The most important one is the implementation of GSO and GRO. GSO and GRO actually allow VPP to exchange 64 kilobyte buffers with the Linux kernel instead of packet-sized buffers. 
This greatly reduces the load on the Linux TCP stack and gives a very significant speed up on TCP connections. So for instance, when an application needs to send data on a TCP connection, Linux will pass a 64 kilobyte buffer to VPP and VPP will segment it before sending it on the network. In the other direction, when receiving packets, VPP will try to reassemble them uh, and pass a buffer that is as big as possible to the Linux kernel. In addition to these improvements that make VPP play well with the kernel, we also had to make a few improvements that were more specific to Kubernetes. Kubernetes has some specific requirements for the network. In particular, the services load balancing requires a pretty specific net behavior. Calico also supports source netting outgoing connections so that your containers can reach external networks, even if they have private IPs. So we developed a custom NAT plugin in VPP that is really tailored to this use case. Another point that is specific to Calico is that it proposes very rich policies. So again, we implemented a dedicated plugin for these policies in VPP. This allows VPP to implement the data plane API of Felix that Casey mentioned earlier. Using VPP as your data plane with Calico also brings many benefits to your operations. So since VPP is packaged as a regular container, that means you can update it just like you would update any other applications. We made it so VPP can be upgraded and restarted with really minimal disruptions to the pod. So if you don't care about the traffic being lost for about maybe one or two seconds, you can just restart VPP and all the pods will be able to communicate on the network normally as soon as VPP is back up. Of course, you can also evict your pods from the host before doing that if that's better for your applications. So this is helpful for upgrading VPP if, for instance, there are fixes that you need to deploy or new features that you want to, to try out. Calico VPP also has very limited kernel dependencies. It basically only needs to tap interfaces, which any kernel that supports containerization supports. This is interesting, in particular in environments where you do not control your kernel. So, for instance, in public clouds, sometimes you don't have a choice of what kernel is used. And that means even there, you can just deploy the new version of Calico VPP and get the latest and greatest features of Calico. So let's see a bit more detail how this Calico VPP integration works. So on the left hand side here, we see the regular Calico network topology. Basically, every pod is connected to the host by one VS interface, and the host is responsible for all the networking functions. When we deploy Calico VPP, VPP inserts itself between the host and the uplink interface. So it takes ownership of this uplink interface, it restores connectivity to the host by creating a tune interface in the host, and it also creates tune interfaces for all the pods. So now the networking responsibilities are split between the control plane running on the host, Kubelet, for instance, will be running on the host, but also the Calico-specific components such as the BGP daemon and Felix. VPP itself is responsible for all the data plane, and that means, of course, routing the container traffic, but also doing the services load balancing, implementing the policies configured by Felix, and so on. One specificity of the VPP network model is that tune interfaces are layer 3 interfaces, whereas these interfaces are layer 2 interfaces. What that means is that there is no ARP going on between the pods and VPP or between the host and VPP. It's all pure layer 3. So now let's take a closer look at what happens to the application traffic when Calico VPP is running. The applications are completely unmodified. They use socket APIs to send and receive traffic to and from the kernel. The kernel in the pod network namespace is then configured to send this traffic over the tune interface that is connected to VPP. The drawback of this architecture is that the data from the application is coming from user space, then going to the kernel space, and then back to user space in VPP. This is required in order to keep the applications unmodified, but it's not the most efficient way. However, 
Another advantage of this architecture is that the kernel still provides the isolation. One other possibility would be to have the applications leverage the VPP transport stack and send their traffic directly to VPP. This would be more efficient, but it would also require modifying the application. It's something that we want to look at, but we will likely support only a restricted set of applications. And finally, this is what you get when you deploy Calico VPP on a Kubernetes node. So in the daemon set that is running on every node, you will get an additional container for VPP. And in the Calico node container, we add a component that we call the Calico VPP agent. So this component is communicating with all the regular Calico and Kubernetes components and programs VPP in order to do the routing, the service load balancing, and the policies. It also handles the CNI function in order to create and delete the tune interfaces for the pods. So this is how Calico VPP works. Now a few words about the product status. So this is, of course, open source on GitHub in the Project Calico organization. Currently under alpha status and um, considered as a Calico incubation project. As of today, we support most Calico features. The features that are not supported right now include um, host policies and some specific configuration features related to BGP. We have started running initial performance benchmarks on this data plane, and as you will see, the results are quite promising. Without going into all the details, we run our benchmarks on a bare metal test bed with two Scalex servers connected by one 40 gig NIC. We used iperf in order to run throughput tests and nginx and wrk to simulate API servers and clients connecting to each other. The first test we ran was an HTTP latency test. So we basically have an nginx HTTP server running on one node and the WRK client located outside the cluster. The WRK client is sending four kilobytes HTTP requests as fast as it can to the server. And we measure the number of requests per second that we are able to perform with that. And we also measure the CPU consumption during the test. This benchmark simulates an external client connecting to a service in the cluster. Here are the results that we got for this test. We see that VPP, Linux, and eBPF are really close in terms of performance, all around 350,000 requests per second. VPP is slightly higher at 370. But what's really noticeable is that the CPU consumption on the server is lower with VPP. Both Linux and eBPF are running at around 80% CPU usage. VPP is at 67. So this is quite encouraging because it means that in order to perform roughly the same amount of work, we are saving quite a few CPU cycles. And this means that there are more cycles available for your application logic. Now, in addition to these HTTP request per second tests, we also run some TCP throughput tests. So in this case, we use the two node cluster with encapsulation between the node. In this test, we have one cluster IP service pointing to an IPF server pod and one IPF client pod, both pods being pinned to different nodes. And we test the TCP throughput that we can obtain with varying number of connections between the client and the server. So with one flow, we can see already that eBPF and VPP are much faster than Linux, twice as fast, uh, at almost 20 gigs per second, while, while Linux is at nine. With two flows, eBPF takes the edge at 36 gigabits per second, VPP is at 30, and Linux is scaling to 17. With four flows, VPP and Linux are catching up with eBPF, and with eight flows, basically all the data planes are saturating the link. VPP has a really fast IPsec implementation. So one thing we wanted to measure is how the VPP encryption compared to the encryption provided by Linux and eBPF. So for this test, we rerun the same tests as before, but this time both Linux and eBPF were configured with WireGuard encryption, and VPP was configured with IPsec. So here are the results that we got. Uh, this test was really favorable to VPP.
Linux and eBPF respectively reach 32,000 and 42,000 requests per second, and VPP is at 250,000. VPP does consume more CPU in this test, but when we compare the amount of work actually being done to the amount of CPU consumed, VPP actually consumes much less CPU per request. Now for the hyperf test, the encrypted hyperf performance is also really good with VPP. Basically, the Linux and eBPF data planes seem to be bottlenecked by the WireGuard implementation at around 2.5 gigabits per second, um, while VPP is able to get 12 gigabits per second on one connection and 36 gigabits per second on eight connections, which is basically link speed. One other aspect that we wanted to benchmark was how VPP behaved when the scale of the cluster increased. In order to do so, we designed a test where we configure many services in a cluster, and we measure the time it actually takes to establish a TCP connection from one node to another. This allows to measure the behavior of the net code in the different data planes. We did that with a custom test client written in Go that sends HTTP requests at a constant rate and measures the connect and the request latency. This client is available on GitHub if you want to try it. This was required because WRK does not measure the connect latency, it actually measures only the request latency, and the NAT implementation mostly impacts the connect time. Here is the median connect latency that we obtained for the different data planes. <coughs> so we see that as the number of services increases, the eBPF and VPP data plane behave really well because the connect latency doesn't change a lot. It's re it remains close to 250 microseconds. On the other hand, the Linux data plane, which in this case is Cube proxy with IP tables backend, doesn't scale that well. Um, and with 100k services, the latency is really huge at more than 6 milliseconds. So that's it for the benchmarks that we have. Um, but there are many other things that we need to measure. For instance, we would also need to measure how VPP behaves when the number of backends of a service increases. And in particular, we want to see the behavior of the system when there is a lot of pod churn, meaning that backends will be added and removed from the different services continuously. We think that it's more representative of a real-life large cluster, and we're very curious to see how VPP will compare to the other data planes in that case. In terms of features, there are also some things we'd like to add. Uh, the first one is WireGuard support. We recently had a contribution for a WireGuard implementation in VPP, and integrating this in Calico VPP will allow us to have better compatibility with regular Calico nodes. We also want to leverage the VPP telemetry infrastructure in order to expose more metrics about what's going on in the containers. And as I mentioned earlier, we also want to explore different ways to bring connectivity to the containers. We expect this to be much more performance than the current tune interface, but as I said, they require application modification. However, one application that's highly likely to benefit from this is Envoy. Envoy is becoming more and more common, and if we can accelerate it with VPP, we think that we could get a really interesting story there. And finally, of course, we would love to graduate from our incubation status to GA in Calico. That's it for this presentation. I would like to really thank both the FDIO VPP and the Calico communities for all the support they brought to this project. If you're interested in trying out Calico VPP, you will find a link to our docs in the PDF version of the slides. We provide configurations that will allow you to deploy it on any cluster, but it can take a bit of tuning to get the best performance out of your system. So if that's something you're interested in, definitely reach out to us. We will very gladly help you with that. Thanks, Alois. I'm really excited to see this project progressing as it, as it makes its way towards GA. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say uh, is really emphasize um, how much I like uh, that this project fits with the Calico design philosophy that I was talking about earlier. Um, I really see this as another tool that we can put in, in Calico's toolbox. And I think it's going to help enable a new segment of users to leverage what uh, 
Calico and Kubernetes uh, brings to the table. Uh, additionally, as a maintainer of Calico, I'm really excited to see uh, the community picking up such a you know big project and really driving this to comp completion. Um, and really happy to see you taking advantage of uh, you know some of the ways that we've architected the code to to drive innovation in the way that you are. <laughs>